and for starting. Okay. Um, well, it's it's great to see so many friendly faces on um, on this talk, and and so many of you who are participants um, in the exhibition. And for those of you who don't uh, know me, um, I'm Ann Corso, the executive director of the Southern Vermont Art Center, and I'm really honored to introduce uh, my guest tonight and tell you a bit about um, the exhibition, Unmasked, uh, Artful Responses to the Pandemic. Uh, but first, I need to give credit where credit is due um, and acknowledge the person who curated and conceived the exhibition, our manager of exhibitions and interpretive engagement, uh, Alison Kreitz. And in truth, um, you should all know that Allison, Allison should be the one leading this panel. Uh, but her newborn twins may have different ideas about her priorities. So I'll do my very best to stand in for her tonight. Um, and so the exhibition really kind of arose out of a tradition, we're calling it a tradition, it's, it's in its second year, um, a tradition to do something unique during the winter months, uh, because Southern Vermont Art Center has often been a quasi-seasonal uh, kind of arts organization and to do something that engaged our year round audience. Um, and in this particular year, we wanted to do something thematic. Now, it won't surprise any of you that, of course, the theme that we chose this year was the pandemic. What other theme could there be for the year? Um, but what's been particularly interesting and compelling, I think, are the conversations that really have arisen out of this exhibition and particularly the conversations that um, the participating artists are kind of having through their work. Uh, at times it's been a return to nature, sometimes a re-examining of personal relationships or new methods of creation. Um, sometimes it's documenting uh, the political scene or longstanding injustices, um, or even the medical crisis of the pandemic itself. Uh, but the exhibition uh, Unmasked, I'll, I'll sort of use shorthand uh, with all of you, brings together over 40 artists, um, four artist collectives, um, some people from as far away as Tokyo, uh, many from across the country, and uh, many of the artists uh, that are exhibiting with us uh, during the exhibition uh, are showing with us for the very first time. Um, some familiar faces, of course, and then uh, we're, we're really excited to have uh, a number of new people coming into the fold. Um, so I'm honored to introduce uh, Eben Haynes and Delaney Dameron of the Shelter in Place Gallery. They'll give you a wave. Um, joining us from Boston, although I think you're both still in Boston, is that right? Correct, yep. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Delaney Dameron, uh, excuse me, and Diana Weimar, who is the creator of the Tiny Pricks Project, um, who I believe you're still in British Columbia, right? Are you still on the West Coast, Diana? Yeah, I'm in Victoria, so I have a much longer day after this talk. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, um, so before I sort of launch into um, to our questions and our, and our panel, um, I'll, I'll give everyone just a few um, housekeeping notes. We have everyone by default, with the exception of our speakers on mute. Um, what is really sort of easiest for flow, we'll ask you to put your questions throughout the talk um, into the chat room. Um, and then Aaron, who is our manager of education and, and our Zoom guru here, uh, will kind of organize those questions as we move through the course of the talk. Um, for just a second, I would love to show all of you who haven't seen the exhibition yet, um, I'll share my screen and just show you a couple of the images so you have a little bit of context. And I'm sure um, Diana, Eben, and Delaney will, will dig a little deeper into some of the specifics that they, they want to talk about. So before I introduce them, uh, let me see if I can properly do this with you.
and I think everyone everyone can see. Am I am I right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, so just showing you a couple of installation shots um, for those of you who haven't been to Southern Vermont Arts Center. Um, the exhibition is in our Yester House building, which is a 1917 historic house that is broken up into about 10 different display galleries, all of them very domestic in scale. Uh, so I, I won't literally tour you through each one, but you'll start to get a sense of what the exhibition looks like, the variety of works, um, figurative, multimedia pieces, um, a photographic series here, um, our wonderful library that is home to um, uh, one artist in particular, and then the mask project out of the Vicki Myron Gallery uh, at University of Denver, um, the sign of the times, uh, one of the themes, and uh, the mask coming out of the University of Denver. Um, Evan and Delaney, this is the first sort of pan shot that you'll see of the shelter in place gallery, but for the rest of the folks, uh, just kind of focus on the artist's large work and their miniature work, which you'll come to understand a little bit better through the talk. Um, it's some really terrific pieces. And then of course the Tiny Pricks project is fully installed um, in one of our downstairs galleries and um, Diane, I don't know what you're used to seeing when, when you um, have these works sort of all together, but um, they really make quite a powerful showing as they are installed sort of um, gallery style here in, um, in our exhibition galleries. And for all of you, just to get kind of a sense of, of what Diana will be talking about, um, there's a, a zoom on uh, some of the particular pieces. Um, so as I kind of um, move, uh, move out of that, um, let, me, let me see, let me start with um, Evan and, and Delaney first. Um, you know, your, your world and Evan's in particular, your world was kind of uh, turned upside down when uh, the Boston MFA was, was shut down. Um, and you saw an opportunity to create the shelter in place um, exhibition. I'm wondering if you two can tell um, our audience here a little bit about that project. Okay, let's see if we can share our screen. Oops. Can you guys see, see a presentation? Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'm Evan Haynes and my fiance Delaney, Delaney Damron and I started <laughs> Shelter in Place at the beginning of the pandemic in early April. Um, we are a 112 scale miniature gallery that allows people to put on pretty ambitious solo shows um, and make large works that generally they wouldn't have the spatial or financial ability to create. Oops. I think it did go up there. Oh, there you go. So um, about me, I am an artist and also a graphic designer for exhibitions at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and my role is I built the gallery. I'm sort of the voice of the gallery on Instagram. Um, I do a lot of the photography and co-curation of shows. And I'm Delaney. Um, my role at SIP is also, I help with uh, the photography. I also help with the co-curation and then I'm a project manager in my day job. Um, so obviously that translates to coordinating um, the logistics of working with so many artists. We do about a show a week. Um, so there's a lot of coordination there and project management, calendar planning, things like that. So um, definitely able to put my day job uh, to, to additional work here with this project. Um, so the gallery actually started back in March of 2019, um, when, which was a very cold and wet kind of early spring, late winter. And I was, got pretty sick of standing soaking wet in my freezing cold studio. Um, and so I started making kind of what would be like a, a dream studio that had everything that my current studio didn't have, uh, which included windows and tall ceilings and heat. Um, <laughs> and so here you can see at the very early stage, um, it's kind of pre-paint and before I figured out how to, how to really do any of it. Um, 
and so it was it was originally to be a place to hold little like maquettes and things of larger works that I wanted to see made large um, but as the weather got nicer it just kind of sat in my studio collecting dust half finished uh, but when the pandemics began and everything closed down in March, I got furloughed from my job at the Museum of Fine Arts and basically had to, I had a shared studio, so I basically had to move everything home. Um, and all of a sudden my studio went from a relatively large space to a tiny desk in our apartment. So it was in pretty, this room. <laughs> in this room. So it was pretty paralyzing for me artistically. Um, but I found that starting back in on the model was a good way to kind of just keep my hands moving without making anything that was too uh, too much emotional weight or anything. Um, and it seemed like a good time to start making miniatures so I can uh, to to plan for larger things that I wanted to do post pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the finished room where you can see it's got beams and baseboards and conduit and um, again it's kind of exactly what I would like a studio to be if Boston was at all affordable and if <laughs> this building hadn't already been turned into luxury condos. Um, and here's what it looks like from the outside. Um, I mean I think the the cool part about this project was that Evan was able to build so much of it out of things in our house. Um, so like the windows were made out of the containers that like fruit comes in, like our <laughs> blackberry and basil containers, what we did all the windows with. Um, the rest is just map board and paint, um, you know, some some birch wood I think in there. So um, yeah, we just pieced it together. It's not as pretty on the outside as it is on the inside because it's all about the inside. Um, but it's yeah, pretty cool. And that's just a quick shot from the outside. Um, so basically after, you know, Eben had really built it out to utilize it as a maquette, um, we had the idea that, you know, we had so many friends that were also feeling how Eben was feeling, um, you know, that that they couldn't, they didn't have access to studios. A lot of their shows had been canceled. Um, you know, even students in college whose singer, singer shows had been canceled. So we were like, let's just offer this space to friends if they want to mail stuff to us, we'll photograph it for them for their portfolios. Um, so just kind of a way to help out friends and family try and continue um, creating art through the pandemic. So we did that. Um, you know, Evan was posting it to his Instagram account um, with the permission of our friends that we were showing. And then pretty quickly, I'll jump to this next one here, pretty quickly um, it picked up. Um, so we created a, an Instagram account just for shelter in place gallery, um, created an email address and said people could send us per proposals, um, but it all works with real artists um, creating real artwork. They mail it to our house, we install it, we photograph it, we mail it back. Uh, so it's pretty quick. Um, it's all kind of photography based um, and then posting it just to our Instagram account um, and our website. Yeah, and so from the beginning, we kind of saw that even though everything is completely false, um, the because the space is like this old rotten space, it kind of leads this leads to this feeling of reality, um, which was a lot different from a lot of the virtual shows that were trying to fill the void at the time. And also because we were really upfront about it being a miniature space and it all being fake, it really kind of allows people to uh, feel like they're in on the joke and and can they can kind of um, interact with it in a much more meaningful way because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so each of our shows are four days long. Um, originally, we were having two shows a week because Evan didn't have a job, so he was able to like dedicate a lot of time to it. Um, so we were having two shows a week that were about like four days, um, and now we have one show a week. Um, but all the shows are still four days long. Um, and something that um, Evan had done, and then a few of our friends that had sent us work right when we first started showing was they leaned into creating these installation pieces. So as you can see, like Miles Schaff on the left and Matt Murphy on the right created these crates. Um, you know, they said that it took almost as much time for them to make these miniature crates as, as their pieces for their show. Um, but it really opened the door for artists to um, be creative in, in new ways and have fun with it. Um, and so that's kind of stayed a tradition of all of our shows is that we'll always do an installation shot and allow artists to make, you know, unique installation pieces, um, which also still kind of pokes fun at the, the real gallery experience, real museum experience that artists have. Yeah, but at the same time, when, when it was impossible to have a quote real show, this making the crates and kind of, uh, it was kind of like the, 
the finishing move on 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 an exhibition that made it feel very real for people right. at the time. Um, and also because of the small scale things, artists are able to respond really quickly to events, which makes things very, very current. Here's just a few um, shots too from from other artists that we've shown with, but. Um, yeah, so we've we've been able to have 58 exhibitions. We've shown almost 70 artists since COVID started. Um, so we've been able to give a lot of exposure to artists that they potentially otherwise wouldn't have been able to have during this pandemic. Um, still averaging, you know, a, a show um, a week, so for at least four exhibitions per month. Um, and yeah, a, a nice, healthy uh, group of people following us on Instagram, uh, following along for the journey. Um, it's just been really exciting and a, definitely a unique experience. Um, so in December, we announced that we were kind of moving into a new space, which actually just this morning, we, we dropped off the old gallery at the Museum of Fine Arts, which was uh, if we weren't in such a big rush and didn't have meetings to get to, it would have been a pretty <laughs> touching moment. Um, but as long as we really loved the original space, it was important to us that we could continue this idea as long as it was useful. And um, so the museum has had came calling and asked if they could permanently house the project. But um, knowing that the museum doesn't have the same bandwidth to produce a show a week like we do, uh, it was very important to us that that we could continue this on at the same rate. And so we had to start building a new gallery. Um, so after a few months of hemming and hawing and planning and mock-ups and measuring, um, I finally got started building it in November. And you can, this is just the very basic uh, cube. Um, and one of the most important things about the new space is we wanted to address some of the difficulties of the old space, which was being able to photograph things <laughs> easily. And because and, I am just sticking my arm in, into this room. So yeah. multiple access points was really important. So this we, new gallery has two doors. Yeah. And we currently have to like, it lives in our house and we currently have to like rearrange, or we did have to like rearrange our living room every time we shot a show because it wasn't created to be really photographed in at the rate we do. Um, so we have to like press it against a window. So we literally like rearrange our apartment every time we do um, a photo shoot of the work. So this new build, we have a lot of uh, requirements so that maybe we don't have to disassemble our living room uh, to photograph shows. Yeah. Um, so here's just some in progress shots of floors first stained and then painted and you can see the big elevator uh, freight elevator door on the left is is the main access point and then the little double doors on the in the right image is another access point so we can just pull those photograph. off and stick our arm in and photograph um you can see the arduous process of bricklaying uh there's delaney using a screwdriver to scribe a couple thousand bricks uh, into some foam core um you can also see why we were thinking a lot about wood stoves at the time sitting in our freezing cold studio. <laughs> um, a couple close-ups of just your doors and windows. Um, it was pretty important that all this stuff kind of feels very feels very real because that way it just disappears and the artwork is the only thing you're looking at rather than some kind of half done little piece. Um, and once everything was kind of built we it was time to paint and age everything appropriately to make it look like it's just been sitting abandoned for a long time um yeah and on the right you can see i started aging the floors and just kind of beating them up with a rock um and here it is all finished with the light coming in which was a, a really re rewarding thing to see <laughs> in actual sunlight and looking like it makes sense mm -hmm couple more images of that. And here's the back half again, which is exciting that it is a four walled gallery now as opposed to three walls in the invisible nothing void behind it. <laughs> um, and once our handyman installed our wood stove, <laughs> we were able to restart our exhibition programming. And so today actually marks the fifth show that we've had in this new space. And we're pretty excited about it. And in 2021. And in 2021. <laughs> and that's it <laughs>
Amazing. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Thank you. You too. Um, Diana, let me bounce to you and the Tiny Pricks project, which um, I, I think you'd agree is, is now more than a project. Maybe a movement is, is a better term for, for what you've created. Um, but can you talk our audience through sort of how this got started and how it grew so exponentially? Um, yeah, I, I first have to say, I really hope I get invited to your wedding. <laughs> Will that be, or, or will you have a virtual church or a ceremony or something? <laughs> um, I have so many questions for you guys. Um, I hope somebody's made little dolls of you installing, but um, that was an amazing presentation. And uh, I feel like now I should take the tiny off tiny pricks because I don't really, uh, I don't really deserve that that title anymore. Um, Trapping seeing something truly tiny. Um, well, I mean, I can I can relate to a lot of the things that um, a lot of the challenges that that we've already sort of touched upon. Um, my began this project. Well, it's hard to sort of talk about when this project began, but one of the most important things to know about me is that I grew up in the wilderness, and of course, that was a long time ago. Um, that was 1970 to 1978, but my parents were American and they left the United States for personal and political reasons. So that's another thing that I think has kind of come full circle, but um, I grew up in the wilderness, no electricity, no indoor plumbing, um, no doctors, no, <laughs> no, no nothing. So toilet paper, we had an outhouse. So I, you know, I'm very comfortable with the pandemic basically. Um, you know, we, we would run out of things all the time. Um, but the important thing to know about that is that everything we had was, you know, that we used frequently was more or less handmade. My parents didn't allow us to have plastic toys. Um, anything that was functional, if it broke, it was either fixed or it became something that you played with. And so my parents were hunting and fishing. My mother learned how to tan moose hives and make moccasins and gloves. So I grew up watching my parents problem solve and make things all the time. And I also knew that we had left the States because my parents' form of patriotism was to protest the war in Vietnam. So those were things, but, but it isn't to say that they weren't, you know, even though we didn't have, you know, we couldn't consume the news, um, I was very aware of, of politics in the US and, um, and the very hard choices that, that people have to make and the feelings that they have when they no longer um, agree with what is happening in their country, but they still love it. Um, and all those things come forward now. Um, I was in art school and I have four children. And so I was always on the go. And I found that stitching was a way to do something with my hands and to develop a practice while running around taking kids to squash practice and the many things that I was doing. And so I had started that practice in 2012. And I was working on, always on words, text, uh, and photographs. So I was working, taking photographs from uh, photographers who were capturing different humanitarian crises, um, the Ebola crisis. And so I was stitching images from these different events into textile that I had inherited from my grandparents. So, these things all sort of come full circle with tiny pricks, the, the political history of my family living in the wilderness and making things, um, the trunkfuls of textiles I inherited from my maternal grandparents when they passed away. And my mother very quickly said, I don't want these, <laughs> you have to store them. And my teenage daughter said, we don't want these, you have to do something with them. And I started looking at these textiles and they were so beautiful. They were christening grounds, they were stained, they were old, they were monogrammed handkerchiefs. They're, they were the things that became Tiny Pricks Project. And, and then there was time and necessity. Like others, I was trying to figure out how to make art and still take care of my family and function. And so I had this practice. I started doing public projects because I enjoyed engaging with other people and I didn't want to stay alone in my world. I wanted to see what other people were making. And I started working with a peace building, building organization and my first public project was in Nicosia, the last divided capital city. And I did a textile project in the Turkish and Greek Cypriot sides of the UN 
buffer zone and in the buffer zone. So, I mean, I just sort of, you know, it's one of those things where you make up something and then they accept you and you think, oh my gosh, I, I'm going to go to Cyprus. Is that okay? And <laughs> should I get my passport stamped when I cross into the Turkish Cypriot side and all these, these things that I was learning and the project, the conference is about using tech tool, technology tools for peace building, but they also include an arts program. And that was the beginning of a five-year relationship that took me to Bogota, Belfast, um, Tijuana, San Diego, I'm missing a city, um, Zurich. And it brought me together every year with people who were thinking actively about politics and peace building and how we use these peace building tools and how the arts can be used as peace building tools. So you would think that all of this would sort of, you know, make tiny pricks a sort of obvious thing to do. But when Trump was elected, I was in the middle of another international project called Interwoven Stories, which was using more of a UNESCO cultural mapping prompt where people would get a fabric page and into that page, they would stitch a story about their sense of identity and belonging. And that project became over 300 pages. I did it with the Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco with Build Peace in these different countries that I mentioned earlier with trans and gender diverse teams, uh, the entire island of Nantucket, uh, any one of my friends that I could make, make a piece. <laughs> um, and so that became a really big project. So I thought at the time, and I still hadn't figured out what to do about the Trump presidency. And it wasn't until January of 2018 when I had a particularly large piece of textile that I had inherited from my maternal grandparents around that I was trying to figure out what to do with. And I heard Trump say, I am a very stable genius. Um, and that became, because I happen to have it here, um, that became this piece. And you can see how, how ugly this piece, <laughs> cushion, <laughs> this piece is, but that was the original. It was this sort of mustard colored, which I think is a, a seat cushion. So they, it went over a stool or something and then somebody must have gotten rid of the stool and cut it out, gave it to my grandmother who gave it to my mother who gave it to me. And I sort of had an hour drive from Princeton, New Jersey into New York and I stitched I'm a very stable genius and posted it to my 500 followers on Instagram and was so pleased <laughs> that 15 people liked it. Um, and I thought, well, I will do one quote a week because I had some concerns. One of my concerns was that Trump would become more presidential. And so his actual policies and behavior and language would, would not, um, get the same kind of critical attention that I thought it deserved. He would just appear presidential. The, the, the pomp and circumstance, all, the, all of the people around him would sort of transform him into what seemed like an acceptable president. And I, I cannot believe how wrong I was about that. I, I, I think, I mean, I mean, I can't, that was really my greatest concern at the time was that we would forget that he was really who he is and, and we, I mean, it's, it's happening now, it'll happen tomorrow. Up until the last minute, he will be unfit to be president. And so I thought I'll do one a week and I thought I'll have a funny little show by the end of his presidency. He probably won't last the full term. And, you know, it'll be fun. It's kind of fun. And, and I'll have this material record. Um, and so I started doing one, one a week and then I started doing one a day. And once you start looking at his language, and you feel compelled to create a record with some integrity, you can't stop because there is so much material. And you think, well, well, that issue, that quote, this, I mean, they're the obvious ones. We can all rattle off 20 or 30 of the top 10, or as they're now referred to in the project, the classic quotes, uh, as if somehow there's something classy about them. But, um, I felt compelled and, 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 you know, I started spending less time with my family, <laughs> you know, retreated into this world of making pieces. And thankfully a group of friends that summer, I think sort of rescued me and said, let's do a workshop and, and you can show us how, and at this point, even though I'd done public projects, it had not occurred to me to inflict this project on anyone else. And I apologize to all the, those of you who have made these pieces up because it's hard thing to, as we were talking about earlier, to ask somebody to commit their time 
their creativity, their skills to something that is so challenging. Um, and I would say ultimately, you know, every piece is beautiful, but there's a hard process that the person who's gone has gone through to make one. Um, it's a big ask. And this group of friends got together and this was around the time when Trump had said um, she had blood coming out of wherever. And it just immediately, this group of women that I see every summer, um, but I don't know anything about their stories in this particular way or their politics necessarily, everybody started talking about, you know, sexual harassment at work, um, you know, different things that they felt about the presidency, what, how they felt about different quotes. And it became really clear to me that I could get some help doing this, <laughs> which seemed like a pretty genius idea. <laughs> and that just the process of making the pieces alone validated the project because I didn't, you know, at that point, again, I didn't know how big it could become. And the other thing I learned quickly was that Instagram, like your tiny studio, Instagram was a place where I could exhibit work. And it was so exciting for people to know and every piece is posted to know that their work would be shared and seen and that they would have a picture and that picture could be shared. And so Tiny Pricks is a physical collection and it's also, and it's, it's, it's an online gallery on Instagram and, and you know, the, the sharing of stories, the history, the textile, um, I've never had the time or, or the help or the money to do what I really would love to have done if I'd known how big it was gonna be, become, which is to, you know, you can imagine all of the uh, data and, and infographics and things you could do with a project like this because quotes can be repeated. They come from different parts of the country. They come from different parts of the globe now. There's a chapter in Brazil and in the UK. And imagine your, the, the show that you have up is, is related to COVID, but you could have a show related to climate change, to language against women, to immigration. I mean, it just goes on and on. Or you just scramble it all up and it's this, it, it's like a three-dimensional Twitter feed. So there's so many different ways to go with the project and so much information to collect about people because every piece is someone's story. And that story, they're just, we have such a longing to connect and to address crisis. So even before the pandemic, with Tiny, before George Floyd was murdered, Tiny Fr Pricks always felt every day like we were um, addressing an issue that was a crisis to, to us. Um, so it, you know, this is the last day, uh, official day of the project. So it's kind of amazing to spend it here with all of you. Um, because it ends when he's out of office. I've always said it'll end when he's out of office. In its current incarnation, what's clear now is that there's a, there's a lot more work to do. So the project will, I don't know if I can build a new studio, but, <laughs> but I can do something that will allow this platform and space to still exist because it's, it, it has a life of its own. Um, I was doing a panel in, once and they didn't let me into the room to join the panel. And they finally realized I wasn't, that that I had a name they just <laughs> they didn't know who Diana Weimar was and so they didn't let me out of the green room they just kept me waiting because they expected to see Tiny Pricks project and and that's been a strange piece of it so it grew really because of these different early influences in my life because friends joined in and then it just it's a grassroots movement people stepped up and people said I will exhibit this project which is very brave um, because a lot of people said they wouldn't because it's too political. Um, people told their friends about it, people shared it, uh, people wrote about it. And, you know, each of these little things is a sort of the New Yorker piece was a really big part of the project growing. Um, the show in New York at Lingua Franca in the West Village because New Yorkers knew who Trump was and they were, you know, personally offended on a regular basis that he was, you know, a New Yorker though he is no longer, uh, I guess. Um, so all these different things happened and it just continues to grow even, even today um, because there's a need. There's a need to make something. There's a need to start and finish something. There's a need to be seen. There's a need to share. There's a need to not feel helpless and 
to feel connected to each other. And uh, I think, I guess that's it. I, I mean, it's, as you can tell, it's, it's a pretty emotional process for me. And today's been a pretty uh, emotional day. Um, watching, you know, how the Biden um, inauguration committee has addressed, addressed the pandemic through these visual messages, the flags and, and the, the, um, the lights along the reflection in the Washington Mall and, and link. I mean, it's just amazing to see a president go back to visual, go back to the arts, to go back to, you know, seeing things being made that represent who we are. And uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, you know, th these projects are so different in, in in so many ways, and yet they're they're, for lack of a better term, threads that kind of run through through both of them. And as someone who's been really immersed in contemporary art, I've I've always been one that thinks that. Um, you know, the, the larger the work, the more immersive the work, the more powerful. And there's something really interesting about the intimacy and the very, very small scale of, of both of these projects. And, and I'm wondering um, if, if you both could talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, Evan and Delaney, I'll, I'll sort of bounce to you first, but this idea of a very small works makes something, I think, all the more powerful. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, one of the one of the uh, big similarities between the two projects is is that so much of it is about these kind of shared traumas and these airing of these shared traumas. Uh, most of the work that we show is extremely personal and about either what is currently happening or what has happened in people's past lives, or you know, it runs the gamut. But it, but it's very personal experiences made to look enormous and made to be shared. Um, right. I think too, you know, this the size or the scale of the works in, in our gallery um, ha also makes art more approachable in a way I don't think we realized originally, but that, you know, a, a really large show in a gallery might um, feel intimidating to a lot of audiences who are less immersed in the art world. And if you're just looking at a photo on Instagram and you know it's miniature, it's kind of like cute no matter how heavy the topic, right? Or how intense the art is. It's still tiny, it's still miniature. So it feels a little bit safer or that's the feedback we've gotten is like this, the work can be, you know, about police brutality and it can be this huge, you know, taking up the whole space, but at the same time it's miniature and it's still somehow a little bit safer and more approachable to people. It's surmountable in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And Diana, I mean, for you, you, you joked earlier about, oh, my work's not small enough now that, you know, <laughs> looking at um, uh, the miniatures in, in the shelter in place, but there must be some, you know, even the largest piece I think that we've installed is only what, 12 by 12 inches, perhaps? Oh, I didn't mail the quilts to you. <laughs> oh, okay, fair oh. enough. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. Um, I think what is similar, well, yes, there, so there's this, there's, there's this ratio always, I think, um, with the pieces that, that are in my project, the, the handheld, they're, they're generally pieces because it's made by hand, that you hold by hand, that you would pass to somebody that you would have in your purse, that you would have in your pocket. Um, but one of the things that's very, that, that's also very similar is this, um, it's not a trick, but if you see something embroidered, you have an assumption about what the text is. You assume it's this. And when you realize it's not, and I saw this every day when the exhibit was up at Lingua Franca and they had done a window and they had a cut out middle of the window so you could look out when you were in the store, see, see people walk by and they walk by, they look at it, they spin their heads and they go back and they start to read. And there's a trick there, which is that embroidery and you know, stitching is supposed to be this calming, beautiful, you know, sort of heartwarming sayings or something that you would pass on to a family member um, to show that you love them. And this is, this is a different kind of love and, and it's unexpected. And I think that is um, that mystery and that that kind of element 
I can retweet something that Trump has said, but it's very different to read it in embroidery. And I see that all the time. And I see that when people repost pieces because you know what you're, you know what you're reading, but you're seeing it. You're seeing the object. And that's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a trick, but it's also a very powerful one. Um, and I think it's the same thing with the scale, you know, but you don't know. And your, your, your mind and your eyes are working harder to understand what you're seeing. And there's pleasure in that work. Right. No, I think that's a, that's a great, um, that's a great insight. I'm, I'm also struck by the idea or, or sort of maybe the juxtaposition of kind of the seriousness of the subjects um, and then the humorness, you know, the humor sort of inherent in it. And um, Diane, I'm wondering if you can and talk a little bit about, I mean, Trump's quotes are so, they're so funny, they're not funny in a way. And yet somehow there's something, you know, when we're looking at these, these images, particularly the actual figurative images of, of, of Trump or whomever, um, there is humor. I think there's at least a humorous intent on the part of, of, of some of the artists. Would you, would you be able to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, the, the, the main thing I would say is that humor has a lot to do with circumstance. And so people make a piece and before the pandemic, I would only post if I physically had the piece in hand and I had to change that because of the pandemic. I didn't want to send people to the post office. There was this overwhelming need, you know, desire to participate. And so I had to go to virtual submissions. But before that, I would have like a, it's like your Spotify playlist. I would have a pile of pieces waiting in a queue to be posted and say there are 30 pieces, four of them are going to be funny. Okay. So, so funny as in, are you making fun of him or is he making fun of someone or funny as in ironic and funny as in um, there's a little narrative twist in there. There's something that you know about what he said that gives you a certain reaction. And so depending on what was happening politically, I go to this sort of bank of, of images and post. You're not gonna post, a, so, so knowing when something is going to be funny has a lot to do with what's happening. You're not going to post a cer cer certain piece five days after the murder of George Floyd. It's just not, it's not funny. You know, I can stand middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and not lose voters. Always trying to figure out when to post a piece because it's always part of this longer narrative. And so that's one of the things that makes it sort of funny or ironic. Um, I don't, in my pieces, I don't make fun of Trump's body. That's not of interest to me personally. I don't think that's, that's not where I find, um, you know, I find the humor. And honestly, and it's been much harder to make things sort of funny, um, to, to find it funny. But I think that there's human nature, which is that you'll see when people come in and see your exhibit, they can look at any number of the pieces and they will go back and forth between, I didn't know he, I, can't, I forgot he said that, to appreciating the artist's work, how did they make that, to a kind of sense of humor which draws us back to the things that we thought and the things that we now know. It's a miracle, it's gonna disappear by April. That, that's not really funny, but it is, you know, you know, drinking, you know, bleach, letting light inside the bodies. These things are not, they were funny when he said them because we couldn't believe he was saying them. We could not believe it. And so it's always playing with our, you know, suspension of disbelief, the timing of what's happening, and then the work of the artist. And each artist has a different way of telling the story and, and showing, you know, their humanity and in their humanity, there's sometimes humor, but it's, I have to tell you, it, it's been a lot harder since, since, you know, March to, to make anything feel um, funny in the way it used to feel funny. Do you know what I mean? It, and I just see, like, I see Colbert, I see everybody struggle with it. I think it's a, it's a thing to struggle with, but um, yeah. My kids don't think I have a sense of humor. So maybe that's, maybe I'm more, you know, that's just, I got stuck, but it's, it's hard now. Yeah. No, yeah. I agree. It's, it's so much harder because 
the world is just so unfunny that right. to make fun of any of it is is making light of a very serious issue half of the time. Um, I mean, so the way that we approach humor with the gallery is, is partially just by pretending that it is a full size space and that we have a large staff who works on it and that it's very difficult to install these giant installations. Um, but that came out primarily because at the beginning of the pandemic, the, the, the people who were let go from galleries and museums are all the back end people who actually make the place run, unfortunately, um, myself included. And um, so it was a way of kind of bringing to the forefront the, the work that does go into making things when you walk into a big white cube with three pieces of art. There's a, at least 15 or 20 people working very hard for a couple of weeks to make that big white cube look perfect for that art to sit in. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of try to use humor to, to point at very serious issues that were happening. No, I think those are great takes on 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 both sides or on, on both projects. Um, Aaron, I'm trying to be mindful of the time and, and I wanna bounce to you and see if there are questions on the chat feed or if we uh, certainly wanna open it up to our friends who have joined us this evening. I have not received any questions, but absolutely we can open it up and I think the artists, the featured artists may have questions for each other too. It seems like a good time for questions. Yeah. I'm usually asked who's going to win the election and I, I can't believe <laughs> that. <laughs> we have two winners of this election. <laughs> we could start right back with Diana. You said you have a bunch of questions for for Delaney and Eben, is there anything top of mind? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I, what I was always asked this, um, when my project was gonna end, um, do you um, feel like there's an end point? Because what you're doing is also, it's a, it's a labor of love. You're working with people, you're facilitating their work. Um, it, does it feel like you've gone back to your own work also, or how do you see this public project as part of your own work? And do you see there being a certain point at which you will say, this is sort of no longer, you know, I'm, I'm not, it's going to end. Yeah, I mean, we originally thought it was gonna end when the pandemic ended, uh, or at least, actually, no, we thought it was gonna end when things started to open back up and you could go and see art in person again. But I don't know, it's become pretty clear that that alternative spaces in general are, especially in Boston, something that are just gonna die out even more from the pandemic than it was before. So it seems, it seems like an important thing to keep doing that people are responding to it and people keep wanting to make work for it. Mm -hmm. It also comes know. back, to, we didn't realize and it wasn't the original intent of the gallery, but um, there's a, a new purpose that it is meeting a need for artists um, that they can have a solo show um, for probably less than $15 in materials. Um, <laughs> and it's a, a enormous exhibition that 10,000 people will see. Um, and it's, you know, only the effort to make these works in miniature um, without the concern of, I don't get to create this, um, my, my dream solo show and have to worry about selling it in a commercial gallery or I can't get it into a gallery and we're, we're not selling works. It's all just about supporting the artists and allowing them to create their vision for a solo show and, and meeting that accessibility need that doesn't currently exist for so many artists to be able to see their vision come to life um, for their for their full size exhibitions. Um, and we hope that people, because of this, are able to sell. I mean, a, a right. lot of our <laughs> artists have, have sold works from it, but but that's that's not what we're we're not uh, uh, taking on the commercial aspect of that. So yeah. that mm -hmm. makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. So for now, it's meeting a need and we'll keep doing it. Um, uh, we hope that there'll be avenues for people to be able to come see the gallery, um, you know, in person. Um, we the the old real estate, as we're calling it, uh, is will be up at the Museum of Fine Arts, and just in the April, spring, yeah. yeah. 
um, so so people can go see the um, the older space, and yeah, we'll mm -hmm. look into ways to continue to make it more accessible, both for artists and and viewers here in the next year. That's so cool. Um, somebody asked about the Instagram, how to look you up on Instagram, and I said Shelter in Place Gallery and Tiny Pricks Project, but I know Diana, you've got some other things going on too. To Either or both of you want to give us other addresses? Yeah, I can put them in the chat. Um, also, other, yeah, uh, on Instagram. Just shelter in place gallery for us. Okay. In mine. Oh, and you can look at Evan's, Evan's artwork. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, will you put that up, Evan? Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, yeah. Um, I was thinking, you know, we both have, we both also, um, you know, depend so heavily on on the mail service and shipping and things like that. And I was thinking about, you know, that really was a dramatic change for Tiny Perks Project. This this idea that, um, you know, shipping and and things like that. Do you guys have that challenge? Have you? you know, had artwork that hasn't arrived in time for a show or an opening and, um, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, but what we did do originally and still is one of our missions is to try and keep a lot of art artists local. So we do prioritize artists in the Boston and surrounding areas. So we do have a lot of artists just drop works off. So they call us when they're out front and we run out and grab the box and run back in. Um, but then other artists, um, since it is our submissions are now open nationally, um, do ship uh, through through the mail, and we run into some uh, some surprisingly some delayed, fewer than yeah. than one would expect. Yeah. But um, no, we we realize also how expensive it is to be shipping things all sure the time, <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. I'm sure you know well. I I know very well. I just got a piece today, and somebody had paid sixty seven dollars to mail it to me in Canada, and I was like, ah. Oh, um, I felt so badly for them. Um, I became very aware of that during the pandemic because people, participants had lost their jobs and making a you know decision to mail something to New Jersey for $10 was a big decision. I saved every piece of packing material that, has come, that I have received. Now, not all pieces are mailed in because when I used to do workshops or had exhibits, people would drop off pieces, but I have closets full in three different houses um, <laughs> other people's houses. I just store my boxes. Um, and someday I want to add up all the postage. Oh, just yeah, that'd be so yeah. interesting. We both talk about how our projects are um, inexpensive, but what, you know, is not talked about as much as behind me as a family or, or as a partner. Uh, I had a friend who was asked recently how she could be an artist and she said, I'm married. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, there are a lot of things that make, and especially figuring out, you know, that it's a privilege to protest and it's it's a privilege to have this time to do this. Um, <laughs> is something that, that is really, you know, there's a lot that I've become aware of through doing this project that I just didn't think about before. And I think that's when you do a public project, um, it's public and you're, you're learning a lot about people and, and, you know, I have people send me letters, they send me cookies, they send me textiles and, you know, they're also really sort of sharing of themselves. And there's something amazing about getting that package in the mail. Don't you think? Like, I, I love that experience of mm -hmm. somebody trusting you with their work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, it's amazing getting to open up the boxes from artists and how they've just <laughs> cared so much for their art, you know, and so many instances, so many artists and regular installations, they get to see their work installed and be a part of the process, but they're kind of just entrusting us yeah. fully they just mm -hmm. mail it to us and we just install it and then they see it on instagram it's <laughs> it's less it, you know they, they don't get to be as a part of the process they, they're they're entrusting us so deeply and we're honored that they do yeah and then we feel kind of guilty because we're we're the only people who ever get to see any of this art in right. person. <laughs> right. yeah we have a yeah. sorry i was just saying one really fundamental difference is that i i keep the work <laughs> so <laughs> That is a that is something that that 
you know, mm -hmm. I, it's something I take very seriously. I mean, imagine if you had all, all these pieces you had in your possession. Um, oh we don't have the room. <laughs> you, we, we already have, have like five shows in this room right now. And it's all I under. Mean, there are over 4,000 piece, pieces from other people and I've made probably close to 800, but sometimes I sit and I just stack them and I touch each piece and it's an amazing privilege. Um, and again, thank you, Susan, for helping with the install. Um, but to actually see and hold them and touch them. And, and I love the pieces that are packed well, well, and I also love the pieces where someone's like, you know what, I spilled my coffee on it, but fuck Trump, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so with this project, it's kind of anything goes because, you know, somebody's like, I burnt my piece. I, you know, I backed up over it. <laughs> I know. It's all, it's all messy, but it's all wonderful. But I have this physical collection and, and it has to stay together. That's how I set up the project. It can't, you know, I don't sell participants work. Um, I sell my own to support the project, but I, I have a, you know, I've made a, a, a you know, I've made this deal um, and it's, it has to find a home. So um, I didn't think about making it tiny. That would have been, <laughs> 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 that would have been smarter, but um, I was thinking about your work too, in terms of nostalgia and, you know, dollhouses and playing. And I think that, that my project is infused with nostalgia also. And I think that there's something about your project that sparks that kind of imagination, that kind of play. Do you find that, do people talk about that with you? And Yeah, I mean, I think it, it comes more from the fact that people can, can experiment a lot more just in just so much more quickly than <laughs> they normally could and can, and can try something really outside of their own comfort zone, which, mm -hmm. When I started building it, it was completely out of my comfort zone and it changed my perspective on my own works and how I built my own works and how they were presented. Mm -hmm. um, it's this really great way to just like completely twist your brain around and look at things differently and, and start to notice a lot more things as well. Mm -hmm. I think there's like such an element to like play, but also like craft for artists to make their works that they traditionally make in larger sizes generally in, in the smaller size. And we hear back from artists that that it stretched their brain, that they had so much fun playing to create these miniature works, um, just to think about things at a different scale. Um, it, it's really fun to hear about how their experience has affected their work after they show with us. And a lot of artists have continued to make miniature works after um, Barry Hazard, who ha will, is up at the SVAC in that show, um, has continued to make small works and sell them because he loved to make it small and, and he says they're more a more accessible price point uh, for a lot of people to, to purchase them. So it's, he's continued to do that after his show. Yeah, those are kind of his bread and butter now. Yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> and it also means that he can make the really, really big ones that he wants to make and right. can afford to because he can sell the smaller yeah. ones. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. Right, well, we're closing in on eight o'clock and our hour has gone very quickly, but I think it's only fair that um, I pitch the very last question um from Allison Kreitz our, our exhibition manager um and, and hopefully um it's one that you can I'm sure you you both have thought about this um do shelter in place and tiny pricks uh, project plan to keep the projects alive indefinitely online or, or specifically on Instagram I think um or would would you eventually close down your accounts and why have have it, either of you thought about that well, my account was deleted once by someone. <laughs> no, no, this is just something, to, this is a thing. <laughs> no, no, it's really, and it wasn't some 400 pound guy living in his mother's couch in, on the, in the basement. The night of the opening in New York, the resistance survival chorus sang, New Yorker was there. It was like one of those big special nights of my life. And I just hit 10,000 followers, so watch out. And my daughter went to get my phone to do an Instagram live because I didn't know how to at that point. And she said, your account is gone. And, and I was like, I was just like, no, no, I'm sure it's not. Like I, did, I, did, I didn't have time to think about it really. And, and Lingua Franca was filming it and other people were filming it. And I thought, I'll just, I'll just check it later. So when the event ended, I went on my phone and my account was gone. So think about this. We think we own our Facebook account, our Instagram account. We think this will be there. 
but somebody, well, as we now know, because it just happened to Trump, it can be taken away. And I went through the process of after I had a you know complete meltdown um, because it was my historical record. So keep in mind, like when you write about your pieces and all the comments, everything that people had shared, it was gone. It was just, I, I called my husband, I said, call Instagram. And he's like, no, call Instagram. <laughs> no, there's, there's no 1-800 help. My account's been deleted. I was like, what do you mean there's no one you can call? He's like, there's no one you can call. So I went through this terrible process. You have to go through Facebook. You have to get a number. You would take a picture of yourself with your signature and the number, like a mugshot. I mean, People who were with me that night later described me as being like so calm because I think I was in another world. Like, I think I just couldn't even, I was panicked. So the account came back, you know, the next day at 3 p.m. after I went through these steps and I never found out what happened. So having had it taken away from me, I have come to value it even more and I don't take it for granted. And I don't take it for granted that any one of the people who follow the project, uh, I don't take them for granted. And, and the platform won't go away. The, I think it'll probably pivot and, and it'll address, it'll continue to address political language and what is happening. Um, and it'll move away from the Trump presidency. But if he runs again, or one of his kids runs again, I guarantee you it'll come back in you know the same form and I want to have an exhibit of every single piece like like the Vietnam Memorial. <laughs> it could happen. I know I see someone shaking it, Susan shaking her head. But he just remember how many people voted for him. So the project, like it's not gonna go away. There's a physical collection that someday, you know, you can see some of it now in person, which is a real treat. And, and I'm so grateful for that opportunity. And what you're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg of what exists. So I both are gonna stay. I just don't know quite how things will change, but I'll follow what's happening. I think we're kind of in the same boat. It's public, mm -hmm. it's public record and it's a record of, of a project. And I think I would like it to exist as long as it can, but also, I mean, I think about like, you know, my, my MySpace account from 10 years ago, <laughs> not that still exists. So it's, it remains to be seen what the, what the corporate entities want to do with it. But. Right. We do um, have a website, um, which we actually built to, to make um, all of the shows more accessible for people who don't have social media um, or who wanted to view the shows uh, on their desktop. So we do have a website and we do upload all of the shows with all of the photography from the show to the website. Um, but obviously, um, you, know, you don't see any of the commentary. There's no dialogue or anything like that, like you do get um, from that platform. Um, so there's definitely a lot of value for us and we plan on plan on keeping it until something changes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, I think that's a great way to sort of um, sum up the evening. And I want to thank all of you um, for joining tonight, and especially Diana, Eben, and Delaney for, for being our, our virtual guests for this wonderful program. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the exhibition, if you are in the area, if you're local, I, I do encourage you to come see it. Um, you can do so safely. Um, our, our galleries are such that you can manage, I think, to, to see the art very safely. And if you have concerns and want to see it um, after hours, before hours, or at a different time, please email me or Aaron and let us know. We'll make that happen. Um, for those of you who are further afield um, and, and want a virtual tour, uh, I think between Aaron and I, we could make that happen too. So, so let us know. We want everyone to see it who wants to see it. So. Um, thank you, everyone. Good night.